Good evening and welcome to another art stream featuring myself, Pharaoh, and my two co-hosts, Alexander Adams and Panama Hats. How are you doing this evening, gentlemen? Uh, diversity is our strength, comrades. Uh, I love the nation of Israel and we have nothing to lose but our chains. Wonderful. Well, it's, it's great to have you uh, on the stream this evening. How's the, how's the last couple of weeks been? Any interesting news or uh, updates? Uh, well, I, I have um, news and updates, but I guess that's uh, shilling territory, which we'll get to at the end. Um, but um, Hat and I are both speaking at the Nomos event on Saturday. I, it may have sold out. They, they may, if there's been a cancellation of one or two tickets, you may be able to get hold of something. Um, if, if you literally, if you if you call up the um, call up the event. Just say that you know Alexander Adams personally. <laughs> you might be able to get another ticket, but it's that exclusive right now. Yes. But uh, have you got, have you guys finished your talks? I yes. have. Yes. Uh, yes, I finished mine uh, earlier earlier today. Can, can you can you do you have the titles? Can you share them with us just to wet, wet the appetites of the uh, potential audience here? Uh, mine is simply called the Vanguard Intellectual, um, hyphenated. Uh, okay, so, Hyphen, yeah. very important there. Yeah. Very, um, okay, that's very cool. Sorry, and mine, mine is called a template for the Vanguard in the fine arts. Okay, very good. How, how much crossover do you think you're going to have? <laughs> um, hopefully not too much. <laughs> I, th I think you. I think you both come at things from quite a different perspective, anyway. So I, I feel mm -hmm. you'll be you'll be thinking about very different things. And I think Alex, you you always will have that kind of eye on um, institutions and your kind of background as an artist, while yeah. Panama has got that kind of historiography and literature angle as well. So um, no, it's, it, it all sounds very exciting. And there's a, I think there are, there are a few other people talking, aren't they? Yeah, there's Sam Wickett from Bournebrook Magazine. I think also Scrump is speaking, possibly Evelyn as well, and others. Um, that also, it's, it's a great chance for us to, uh, for, 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 you, for you guys to meet us and for us to meet you, exchange ideas, um, chat in general. So uh, yeah, it'll be, yeah. be a great network. Build, build, build the network, you know, the network of tens. Exactly. Um, OK, let's turn to the stream topic for tonight. Uh, and sorry, in fact, before we do that, um, Alexander, I know you had a few things you wanted to ch chat through following uh, the last. Well, well ju just just one. This is sort of like um, this this is a. Uh, um, I know that Semyagog um, wanted us to talk a bit more about the sort of the, the wax models and the sort of the uh, 18th century um, anatomical um, dummies, as it were. But um, yes, sadly, we we didn't really have time for that. But just we've got this one extra one that. Um, uh, yeah, so this is uh, an article on the Grand Musée Spitzner. Um, Spitzner uh, was was basically he he toured this. Uh, so if you'd like to click on the first image, these are um, this is a uh, these are nineteenth century wax anatomical dummies uh, that were used for ostensibly used for medical purposes, but they are extremely realistic in some ways and what this one actually had um a breathing mechanism so you could actually see the the, the torso expanding and contracting slightly i have to be honest all of these are exceedingly disturbing but i mean this is very accurate it reminds me a little bit of you know the chapman um sculptures. oh the chapman brothers yeah 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 so uh, so this was these were originally yes i think that's the appropriate expression Oh my! This is literally an, this is horrific. This is God. <laughs> is um, cesarean, is it? Yeah. Um, yes. Well. Well. Uh, yes. I should hope so. Yeah. Um, so. So this is an example. So these were produced as. I think these were supposed to be examples used by medical students, but actually, I think that these were more um, curiosities, and they had an afterlife, because they became part of a travelling circus, as it were. Yeah. Um, uh, so you got obviously you got a lot of people in to see these sorts of things um, who were just there for sort of prurient reasons. Mm. Uh. Interestingly, they change. You, you do the cesarean horizontally these days. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, fascinating. 
And this is one where you, there are three stages. I think there's the, there's a skin one, then there's the subcutaneous level, and then this is the internal level at the top. Um, this is certainly one of the weirder things we've covered on this channel, isn't it? <laughs> it's a, a say grace, in my opinion. It's a horrible, <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I, I, I like her slightly pained expression. Yes. <laughs> As you see the 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 four steps are in, but the best part is the hands is the invisible hands there. Yeah, clamping, clamping her down. Uh, yes, I, I, I like that sort of the slight, slightly pained, concern. Rather, um, rather Marian expression, isn't it? You know, like a, yes, like a weeping yes. statue. Yeah, very yes, very close. Uh, uh, yes. Oh lord. Akushma normal. So this is normal birth. Yeah. So I thought that these were these were quite interesting because they they stra straddled uh, no pun intended they were stra they straddled the line between medical and sort of um, carnival show uh, displays yeah. and these are obviously these are these are sort of exemplary um, uh, examples of um, uh, fantastic model making skills uh, but the effect is uh, slightly uncanny it's, it's the uncanny valley really isn't it. I mean, this is the least disturbing <laughs> of the images, and it's a yeah. sort of giving birth. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So anyway, I thought, I thought it was worth adding those uh, as a, just as a slight follow up. Oh dear, I'm pretty sure this is going to get us banned from YouTube. I don't know. This thanks, is, thanks, Sammy Gorg. Yeah, that was really great. <laughs> um, okay, let, let's talk. Let's talk about um, today's topic, which is uh, World War One and the arts, as looked from. From the allies allied side now i've already seen people in chat complain about the use of the allied i just want to apologize the entente is put is a much it's a much better way i actually blame uh alexander who suggested the title so uh it's it's on him um, um but well, um, I, I think i think it's more it's more commonly recognized whether or not you consider it accurate it's more commonly recognized for, okay. for listing purposes um so Hat, this was your kind of concept and your your idea. Do you want to give us a little yeah. thought thought and background to you know why in your mind is uh, World War One an interesting time for well, art? Well, so it originally uh, came about as a discussion um, about the conflict between uh, modernists and anti-modernists around this time, um, because I was reading about the war artist uh, Alfred Munnings. Um, who was a dedicated anti-modernist, um, very, 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 very against all of the things that had happened since the turn of the century, and um, he was. And and it, it, what interested me was that he was doing official war art at the same time that this fellow Wyndham Lewis was. Um, and Wyndham Lewis was the the polar opposite of of, of, of Alfred Munnings, you know, completely immersed in the avant-garde modernism. Um, you know, like all these experimental things. He was involved with the Vortisist, which we'll get onto in a moment. Um, you know, all these, all these kind of things. So, yes, I kind of wanted to look at it because it's a perfect opportunity to show um, a point in time at which there was such fierce competition between traditionalism and modernism in art, or I guess what we should more accurately call, um, I suppose, correct me if I'm wrong, but academic versus modern. Uh, I, I uh, it's, yes, it's, I, th I think that's, that's that's a fair rough distinction. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, you know, this is something quite unique to us because now we don't really have that. We just have, well, I think everyone's quite aware of what we have now <laughs> for, a, for an art scene. Um, but we don't have anything like that kind of interesting dynamic or dichotomy. And uh, I imagine, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the shared opinion of, of the uh, of, of us now is that um, you know, both the modernists and the and the uh, academic art has its has its flaws, uh, but they both they both certainly at least stand for something, and they they they, they both they they both can be confidently called art. Uh, yeah. It's it, it's interesting just for, just from like just going on that point immediately immediately about how do we look back at this period and inter like I think most modern art courses would basically ignore the academic art at this time and purely mm -hmm. focus on on, on the, the the modernism uh and in many ways i would say this is maybe like the first real mainstreaming of modernist art i mean alexander please come come in here but if we if we think about to um 
if you, if you think of it from like an elite theory perspective, you've got uh, the kind of elites at the top, the uh, the non-ruling elites, and what art do those different groups like? And I, I think if if you look at the kind of high Victorian period, eighteen eighty to eight, uh, to nineteen hundred, it's very much that um, like like you said, like pure academ academic art. So, for example, like anyone in the RA w would be um, very much um you know non-avant-garde you know very very traditional and that was the kind of st and it's the style that's loved by um queen victoria you know and the royalty as well that they they have they had so much power over um the kind of the pure elite class now towards the end of her like in the last like five years and then into the edwardian period i, th I think there is a big shift where the the non-ruling elites so again that kind of bureaucratic class the kind of the the the, uh, the merchantmen etc um and their and their children really embrace modernism so you uh, while i think a lot of the elite class coming into first world war so again all of the officer like most of the officer class i would say are have more of a academic bent so it, it is this time where the the elite isn't captured necessarily by one group or the other, um, and, and it, it's this this point of flux. Also, we've got to recognise that even the modernists they were brought up in um, trainings of tradition, if that makes sense. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's not like us today. You know, we 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 are, we are the children of modernism. You know, we're like all of our traditions are dead, basically, or there's that they have died out in a very uh, very deep sense. Um, while all of those tra like traditions still exists people are able to like have things like craft and the the avant-garde like and again especially in england i think the english avant-garde is actually almost quite reactionary and traditional again like yeah like, think of think of um arts and crafts movement is basically like how can we become more medieval and there is yeah. a socialist there is a socialist element into to like morris and stuff etc but it it is quite reactionary however and of course, and of course a huge yeah. number of the involved ended up in the in the uh, fascist camp as well um in the 30s sure. yeah yes exactly um but I, the, the, there is a vein that started i would say with like the um the english modern schools so um like Mac, like macintosh for example and there's a, there's a few others in the 1890s and that's the that's kind of like England's first true modernism, while um, like the French have been doing modernism for a little while b before that. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, but by kind of nineteen nineteen ten, there is a strong cadre of. Uh, like, I mean, could you even call them avant garde still? Like, well, I, I think in in nineteen by nineteen ten, what you have is the big change in Britain is there's a. A, an exhibition of post-modern, um, post sorry, post-impressionism, um, mm -hmm. which happens, which is organised by Roger Fry, who's part of the Bloomsbury Group, and I know uh, uh, there's this famous quote that I, I can't recall because I, I'm no good with quotes, but there was a Virginia Woolf said that in 1910 something changed about sort of uh, human consciousness or human understanding or something, uh, and this is basically the, when the upper class. Um, uh, or especially the sort of the upper middle class, the intellectuals, the academics, the leading artists adopted modernism. Um, so it's been it's been absorbed and adapted from the 1900 to 1910 period, and then in 1910 you have the big exhibition, and it starts to become mainstreamed for the sort of the select few, and this becomes the elite art um, in sort of 1910 onwards. Then of course you have basically a lot of academic traditions and a lot of um, just conventions, people going to um, um, uh, art schools and so forth, um, old style salons, lots of, uh, lots of that just ends completely in 1914. And so that's when people say, oh, well, this is the end of the symbolist movement. This is the end of the Art Nouveau. This is the end of post, uh, post impressionism. And that's when high modernism gets into gear in 1914. Did, and, well, sorry, just just to immediately go off that point. I, I mean, I would say it's a bit more complicated than how Virginia talked about it because, like I said, I, I think you got to split the elite faction up into um, 
the people really in charge and really in power and then again this uh, again the, the the idea of mosca's non, non-ruling elite class so like you said the in, the intellectual class um the art the artistic class etc i i still think that there is strong support east institute institutionally for academic art so again oh, yes. if you look yes, if you look at the yeah, ro- the, the Royal Academy, they have they've st- started to take on some modernist painters, but there's a there's a huge number still a- a- academically. So, but it, it's it, there's almost like a mini there's a there's an artistic war going on between those two factions, with very much like you said, um, the the intellectuals pioneering um, modernism. Fry is also a really interesting guy as well. He's a a, a painter in his own right in, in his own right, but he's also a collector very famous for collecting Picasso's uh, and Cezanne's and yeah. sort of launching Picasso in in the uh, in England he's also uh, an aesthetician aesthetic philosopher and has written some very interesting you should definitely include it as part of your foundations of aesthetics he does quite a famous essay that I've read which is which was um excellent on um on modernism basically and, and what what is beauty and, and beauty tastes so yes. it, it's it's not just um this kind of like a whole load of a groundswell of artists it's not a bottom-up approach it's very much there's uh there's a there's a, an, an elite backed modernist movement that's sweeping through and taking over sorry hat you, you tag him um no i mean that pretty much uh caught some of what i was going to say um yes and and as well i think it's important to illustrate that um, of course, we're using the First World War as a kind of dating point for this. But what struck me was how little, for a while, the war actually affected things. Um, if anything, the modernists seem to really hit their full swing through 1914 to 15, um, kind of irregardless of the war. Um, for Given how utterly to- uh, sort of totalistic and... Um, completely nationally engulfed Britain was by the war. They do seem to be kind of uh, perhaps on purpose, you know, isolated from it. They seem to be kind of working uh, just as they were prior to it. Um, and then, of course, after the war, they kind of, they kind of, then they begin to kind of grasp it for what it is, I suppose. Yeah, um, th- 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 there's an interesting point there. And one thing I wanted to, to say from a meta perspective as well is. <clears throat> Could could this be the most artistically uh, interpreted war of all time? In 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 the in the modern age, we've got uh, again think about the Ukraine conflict. You've got uh, videos and uh, photos and testimonials and interviews, etc. It's all of this kind of raw technological medium. And in the past, you've got like in medieval times, you'd have stories and songs and sonnets, etc. Or, or epic poetry about battles but the world war one's interesting because there's a huge number of um painters that were selected to 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 kind of show what was going on before the event you know there's a lot of uh, in the 18 in the 1850s there's a lot of this kind of posthumous um like a- academic historiography you get it a little bit through um the f- french traditions and uh, actually some polish traditions as well there's, during the nationalist movements a lot of people wanted to display here's the kind of important battle or important moment in the past and so mm. there's this modern interpretation but with world war one you've got um the the elite class realizing this is going to be an important moment we need to put art at the center of it not just from a purely propagandic perspective but also to to capture this moment in time yeah uh, and also you've got to remember that there was lots of links between artists and politicians and sort of senior bureaucrats because these were some of their collectors and obviously they didn't want they didn't want their best at them but their favorite artists in some cases who were personal friends of theirs ending up on the front line so there was this actual push to try and preserve artists to get them uh, to give them jobs that would not put them exactly on the front line in order to keep them alive um to you know to be alive and working after the war was over so this was actually uh quite a degree of sort of foresight and sort of um not nepotism but you know sort of favoritism draft 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 dodgers in the upcoming russian world war three <laughs> please take note um 
j- j- just go- just going on to that again and looping back to Hat's comment about mo- mo- modernism just sort of bubbling away. But o- obviously, y- you do have like different artist colonies just cracking on during this time. Yeah. Uh, interesting, a lot-, lot of people going to Ireland, for example, and using that as a bit of a base. Um, or you know, pa- pacifist in the pacifist movement where they just didn't didn't fight. So I, I, I think oh, we, right. we should point out that Ireland at this point was not independent. It was part of the United yeah. Kingdom. Uh, yes, yes. But like, like I, th- I think there was quite a few people that just left there to, uh, I, I think the recruitment wasn't, I think it was a little bit different or something. So it was uh, it, comparatively more peaceful, at least, I think, um, being over there. Uh, okay. I think I think we've done enough enough preamble. Really interesting time. Lots of stuff going on. Let's let's hear about uh, Wyndham a little bit. So um, Wyndham Lewis um, was uh, he was one of these rare figures that was a painter and a writer and a critic and a poet, but who was actually good at all of those things. <laughs> um, because a lot of the time you do get people who try to be a kind of uh, jack of all trades in art, and they just that all that means is they produce a large amount of material, and they may be prolific in their own time, but because they because they focused on all these things rather than devoting themselves to one, their influence fades over time. Um, because though they produce a lot of art, it doesn't it doesn't stick. Um, Hold on, Hat. Are you having a go at uh, artist critics? Because you've got to be a little bit careful there, my friend. Um, <laughs> I may be, I may be implicating them. Uh, but uh, again, as, as I say, this is this. No, no, no. This, this is not a blanket. Uh, this is not a blanket take on them. Uh, the art. There are many, many uh, great and prolific artist critics. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more talking of people who want to be kind of great novelists and great painters. You know, great painters and great poets at mm. the same time. Um, um, the the Rossettis come to mind actually, but uh, mm. I suppose they have had a lasting influence. So I don't know. Um, but yes, um, and he was born. Uh, he was he was he was reputedly born on his father's yacht uh, off Nova Scotia. Um, and I have heard some Canadians uh, try to claim that that makes him Canadian, but uh, I don't think so. Um, uh, his his mother was English. His father was American. Um, they divorced not long after he was born, or they they no longer lived together. Um, he went to some quite prestigious schools. He went to rugby school, um, where rugby was supposedly invented, and uh, then he went to the Slade, uh, part of the UCL. Uh, or was it was it was it not part of the UCL then? It I was it was not at that stage. It was an independent art school, but right, it was later okay. incorporated. Yes. Can, um, can, can can I just say about the the art schools a second? Because um... One thing we didn't really touch upon on the new sculpture stuff uh, when, when, when we did the um, the golden age of uh, sculpture uh, in the in the late Victorian periods, there's this huge number of um, new art schools that are being created, and uh, for example, like the Lambeth School and uh, Slade. And interestingly, it's, it it takes about thirty years, but within that period of time, they become like England's pre- premier art schools. So you'll you'll hear. If, if for those who don't know, just listen out for Slade because you'll hear it kind of mentioned several times on the stream tonight. But sorry, just as a little aside. Um, I also note that there seems to be a large number of people who go to the Slade and then don't become artists. They become like something completely different. Um, I'm not sure yes, if that's... This, 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 well, the problem with this... Um, yeah, obviously I'm partisan here because I went to Goldsmith. So I was another... <laughs> Um, famous uh, art department in London. Um, yeah, the Slade was known as kind of like as a finishing school. All right. Um, and the, the, there was this lots of complaints from the tutors that they were getting because it was open to women. I think it was open in 1871. It was open to women. They had lots of sort of well heeled women, young ladies coming in just because they had uh, three years to kill before they got married. Um, yes. And that they were not taking art terribly seriously. So. No. Um, Slade's reputation did kind of suffer at that early stage, although they did go on to produce uh, um, a substantial number of uh, serious artists. Mm-hmm. Very, um, very diplomatic there. <laughs> so uh, after the Slade, um, curiously, he he didn't actually um, start making art. He went off on a series of travels. He did kind of further um, studies on art right around the early 1900s. Um, I should say he was born in uh, 1882. Um, so this is now getting into his uh, late teens, early 20s. Uh, 
And uh, yeah, so he goes to Paris and studies art uh, informally, I believe. Uh, um, that, yes, I think he goes to the Academy Julien, yes. uh, which is a sort of like a, an informal school, which you sort of drop in and out of as you mm -hmm. want. And uh, he also uh, studied literature, I believe, and attended philosophy lectures by Henri Bergson, uh, of all people. Um, so, you know, quite, quite a top rate education uh, that Wyndham Lewis got through his early years. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't see the light now, but, uh, uh, he, so he came back to London, uh, sometime, well, went to London for the first time, uh, in 1908, which coincidentally was the same year that his later friend Ezra Pound did. Um, and I believe they, they pretty much hit it off straight away. Um, I think you could, you could call Wyndham Lewis basically the British Ezra Pound, um, in terms of what, what, what they did in their respective fields. Um, you know, I think... You know, these these two were very close uh, personalities in terms of what they wanted from art and and their kind of ambitions and things. Um, and uh, he started working as a travel writer, I believe. Um, initially, um, he was associated with uh, Ford Maddox Ford, though he wasn't Ford Maddox Ford wasn't called Ford Maddox Ford yet. Um, and then he founded something called the Camden Town Group. Um, which I imagine that uh, Alexander would know about uh, probably better than I would. Um, uh, yeah, so these these were basically the Bloomsbury group. Yeah, Bloom, Bloomsbury, but they were more sort of um, realist, not quite social realist, but uh, quite realist, um, grounded in sort of post-impressionism. Um, although actually some of them ended up doing some work in quite drab colours, so they were known as sort of... Um, being slightly dour and not being quite as, as frivolous as the Bloomsbury group. Yes. Um, and uh, he he then, he of course met, he, again, he, he kind of was able to meet all these uh, important um, people uh, very early on. Uh, so he met Roger Fry and uh, the art critic, uh, and I think, and I think the, the, one of the original f um, founders of the Bloomsbury Group and an important critic and theorist, um, uh, Clive Bell. Um, uh, but I believe they didn't get on. I mean, Bell's a yes, funny that's chap. Correct, like, yeah. His his uh, his sister's obviously Vanessa, isn't it? Or is it his wife? Uh, yes, his sister was Vanessa Bell. Um, it's it's yeah. all a very in incestuous group or whatever. I'm, I'm pretty sure Clive is the one. Was it was he gay or had a gay relationship with someone else? It, it's yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, um, I I don't know much about him, but I have heard of him. Um, and then uh, I believe his Wyndham Lewis's next significant thing was that he um, put on some work at the at the uh, the post impressionist e exhibition, the one that you said uh, mm -hmm. was. I think this was a few years later. This was in nineteen twelve. Um, and I think he was he was using uh, Cubo futurism uh, at this point, um, uh, or or something like that. Um, he did yeah, three. Yeah, that, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, and then he was commissioned in 1912 to uh, uh, paint something for the recently opened Cave of the Golden Calf, uh, which was a very decadent avant-garde cabaret in London, which existed right before the First World War and closed once the war got going. Um, and uh, yes, it was kind of a very, uh, well, I mean, the, obviously the Cave of the Golden Calf is a reference to the uh, calf of the, of the Bible that you weren't supposed to worship. Uh, so uh, yes, obviously uh, very, uh, shall we say, underground sort of thing. Um, then he began working with uh, geometric abs abstraction and that's what, and it was looking at his art that Ezra Pound coined the term vorticism, because it appeared to be a kind of vortex of shapes and forms. I believe is is the origin of the term, um, if that's if that's not wrong. Um, uh, yes, though, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, he basically, so according to some things I've read, he wanted to create a fusion of uh, cubism and futurism, um, and I believe he attended a lecture by. Uh, our boy uh, Filippo Marinetti uh, when he when he was in London uh, around 1910, um, and that was a kind of a great influence on him. Um, and I think I think he he, he actually wrote 
uh, a number of somewhat controversial uh, essays critiquing modernism while being a part of it. He was quite a strong critic of things like cubism um, and futurism. I think he said that cubism was dead and that futurism lacked structure. Um, and these these things needed to be needed to be changed. Um, so you know, again, this was not somebody willing to just throw himself into a movement and sort of ride it out. He wanted artistic authenticity and integrity. Um, if he didn't feel that a movement or a form was up, was up to standard, then he would write about it and, and discuss why. Um, and then he um, had he. he Briefly, I think, was with Roger Fry's Omega workshops, um, which I think Alex can probably tell us about too. Uh, I, 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 I can talk a little bit about that. All right, yeah. So, so like, um, the, the Omega workshops is, is what I would describe as the last great arts and crafts movement. So Im imagine um, some of the like Morris-esque ethos around design, um, but with um, kind of modernist aesthetics attached to it so effectively it, it was a arts and crafts design group featuring a number of the artists from um the, the bloomsbury group who would then produce things like uh tables chairs um uh there's a lot of um, ceramics i think uh, fabrics. Yes, yes. exactly and um they, they actually did some dresses at the beginning of the war as well um like and for example duncan grant would hand paint on bits of furniture for example but it was like again if you just google it, omega you can see just some of their stuff it's i'm, I'm a big fan but again it, everything's handmade again it's it's got that kind of um, morrisian ethos behind it but i didn't realize in fact it did Wyndham lewis do some like um some scarves i feel like maybe that's um, brain somewhere or well he was he was originally commissioned to do um i think it was wall um art for the daily mail ideal home exhibition which had been oh, recently cool. launched back then that's still going now isn't it the ideal yes, home yeah. thing yeah. yeah um i don't know if it's uh has, 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 has it become like paused now I imagine. I would describe it as like, <laughs> like, like the home. Chelsea Flower Show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Uh, and he, he had a falling out with Roger Fry um, and ended up not being a part of it. Um, uh, I believe he actually accused Roger Fry of like stealing some of his ideas or some of his artwork. Um, um, yes. And, and, he, and, 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 he, and he went and he went very public with it as well. So that, yes. that kind of. He, he kind of managed to he managed to ostracize himself um, but he was he always would uh would do that um he this is a recurring theme of his life and career he would because of his constant demand for um uh art artistic kind of integrity um and and a willingness to to kind of you know uh fight feuds and you know take these things public and not not kind of be um not kind of be a part of a circle just to be a part of it. He would always be making enemies, even of groups he was supposed to be allied with. Um, is it uh, j j just on that? It's interesting because for me, modernism always always is has a real strong connection to the dealer, and you got to remember that Fry was the critic, the dealer, and the painter yes. as well. So you basically and, had you had to suck up to Fry yes. to get the good reviews or to get into the latest exhibitions. And I, th I think this is again where modernism suffers greatly from is the the, the place of the the, the dealer so um, and, um wasn't, wasn't prepared the, to do that the, the circle around roger fry at the time was i believe quite fawning um for, for the reasons you just described uh so uh yes not not quite not quite the place of such an explosive uh personality i think but um uh yes yeah, so um i believe the next thing he did after that was get to work on this on this magazine called blast um and Blast was basically the official magazine of the Vorticists. Um, and it was also kind of a, a general avant-garde magazine. Um, Ezra Pound was massively involved with it. Uh, Wyndham Lewis wrote like, you know, about a third of the material in it. And when they eventually brought, brought it out, um, I believe I've uh, linked some uh, pictures of it. Yeah there, yeah, there it is. Um, I mean, that, that kind of, that makes it look, that makes it look somewhat modest, but the initial editions were like phone books, you know, these were like yellow page. I mean, these things were 
enormous. They were very expensive. Not many of them were printed because they were still quite a you know pretty niche interest. Um, full of uh, avant-garde art and essays and poetry and serialization of, of, of new books and things. Um, but again, massively unwieldy uh, publication. I think they only printed like um, three of them, like over the course yeah, of two so years. This, yeah, I think so. There, there were delays because of paper delays and also editorial yeah. problems. That's, yeah, um, that's true. The, the, the war made it very awkward. Um, although a, a great a great deal of um, uh, future avant-garde artists would um, would be involved with it. They would have uh, uh, commentary and, and art printed in that. Um, also, I believe the first the first poem, poems published in England by T. S. Eliot in issue two, I think. Yes, because this was right when he showed up, and he he was. Yeah. I mean, he was the extent to which T. S. Eliot was really involved with the avant-garde as such is. A topic of, of discussion for another day perhaps but he was at least friends with Ezra Pound and Wyndham Lewis and there's quite a famous uh portrait of uh, T.S. Eliot uh by Wyndham Lewis I think um yes that's right which yeah. Is, yeah which is a, I think I, li I linked it somewhere uh in one of the image links and there's a picture of Wyndham Lewis in the 20s stood next to it as well uh sorry I I didn't I because uh I had to yeah there it is there it is uh, which one that one um that's uh I believe that's uh Yes, T.S. Eliot by Wyndham Lewis. Um, yeah, that's that's now in South Africa. Uh, really? South African Museum, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Didn't expect that. Um, he also kind of uh, dabbled in, in plays and drama around this time. Um, but of course, by, by this point, the war is ongoing. And um, in 1915, um, I believe Wyndham Lewis actually... Um, because th th there was there was of course this you know in in all sorts of artistic movement movements of the time both both classical and modern there was this uh, kind of some something of a split over you know should the artists go to the war or object to the war and uh, Wyndham Lewis being the kind of uh, adventurous uh, daring type he was um, quite keenly signed up um, he became an officer of the Royal Artillery and got posted right in the uh, the Ypres salient um and if you know anything about world war one you know this was not a particularly pleasant place to be um this was the center of pretty much all major british efforts uh throughout the war um to fight the germans uh, around this around this big uh bulge in the line um and as an artillery observer his job was crawling out of a trench um basically crawling on his stomach across no man land no man's land for possibly miles finding himself a little nook or or a, a um shell hole where hello. he could he could see, oh hello Am I yeah, still with carry you? on yeah still hairy um and uh, yes he would he would find a spot where he could see the german line and then he would basically um he would actually take sketches um this is i think why as an artist he was employed in this manner because he could take take very accurate um sketches of what was happening and uh, register artillery targets. And as the war went on, this became more technological and he could sort of use uh, field wires and things to send back uh, signals to the to the, um, to the the rear. Um, and uh, he wrote about this in a book called Blasting and Bombardiering in the 30s, which talks about this. And, and, and I think it's been corroborated. He was involved with some genuinely close calls. Um, yes, you know, it was. It was an extremely uh, dangerous job. Yeah. Yes, crawling out into uh, the artillery duels, and you know, um, you know, being nearly hit by shells, and you know, being hit by snipers, and all sorts of things. Um, uh, and then, not long uh, towards the end of the war, um, he was appointed the official war artist. And this is the curious thing for both the British and Canadian governments. Um, possibly because of his birth near Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, one of quite a, quite a famous painting was a, a Canadian gun pit, or I think I've linked these uh, uh, variously. Um, I linked one or two of his World War One paintings here. Uh, Ferris still with us? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying Probably to find not. you. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I, I thought your mouse was moving, I thought you crashed. This is this is all I've got. Is this not it? Uh, we're not seeing any image change. No. Hold on. 
I will try sharing again. Uh, yes, and the images of him in his uh, World War One uniform are quite interesting as well. Um, yes, that's it. Yes, there it is. Uh, Canadian gun pit. So this was an official. So this is where we get into modernism becoming part of the elite. They now have elite power because two national governments have commissioned this sort of art. Basically, they went to Wyndham Lewis. They wanted this basically. And I think that was the original spark behind uh, these this stream. I imagine we'll probably do some follow up streams to this um, because you know a few years earlier they're just this kind of eccentric niche group of artists putting out magazines that no one seems to buy and holding meetings in cafes and things and you know doing these kind of outrageous things for each other. And then fast forward a few years into the war and look what you've got. You know the, the this is kind of official uh, elevation. Um, so any comments on that, Chaps? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's correct. I think that modernism does become adopted. Obviously, you've got more traditional approaches to war art, which we'll see later. But um, yeah, this is this is when it gets like the official seal of recognition. And this becomes seen as uh, an appropriate style for um, recording uh, a national conflict and for this to become national property. Mm -hmm. And I think there was also a recognition, um, given that, you know, and, and this is like shocking to us today to think this would happen, but a great number of men serving in the governments of the Western nations went to the war that some of them themselves served. And I think what that gave them was this was this um, this fact that what what they saw in the first world war couldn't really be represented by traditional academic art um not i don't think they felt that you could really get the intensity of it or the kind of alienness of it and this kind of completely because it was a completely new experience in every way and i think that did kind of demand a new way of portraying it in art um which is not to say that there aren't also uh, great um more tr traditional depictions of the first world war in painting um but I think I think that my 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 guess is that that certainly helped um, uh, the modernists become more mainstream. Um, was the First World War and the fact that the leaders of those wars could see it more clearly? I mean, you know, British cabinet ministers joined up and like led attacks in in the trend. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a modern British politician this joining is what, up? This is what I want to see. Battle, you know. Well, half, well, half of them are women, so yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> I, I want to see Bojo on a donkey doing a cavalry charge. Well, uh, I mean, there, Putin. there was a cabinet minister, and he was one of the only cabinet ministers who went to the war in 1914 and, and was still there by the end of the war. Um, and he was a he was a, a cavalryman who who actually led. Uh, a, a Canadian cavalry charge um, through a woodland in about 1917, I think, um, in which, you know, it was <laughs> an awful lot of them died, but, you know, there he was. And then after the war, he just went back to politics, you know, as if, as if nothing had happened. Um, you know, they, we just, we just don't have men of that caliber anymore. They just, they just, they don't exist or at least not, not, not certainly not in, in politics, you know, can you, can, can you imagine like Matt Hancock, you know, mounting up a saddle and you know charging a machine gun <laughs> I don't see it, um, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, um, j just returning to the painting, I think it's interesting you're saying about um, can academic art show the the horrors of war? I, I'm I'm hoping that I can, can convince you otherwise, like later on in the stream. But but I, I, I think think back to what he was saying about his combination of uh, you know futurism and cubism. Um, f futurism, obviously, it's all about the worship of the the machine, about progress. Um, and and there, there is something about like this is the first you know truly mechanized war. Um, you've got artillery. This is kind of a progressive artillery, the progressive technology, but used for for devastating circumstances. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like futurism's like um, logical logical standpoint. So so it has all the, that kind of, that kind of baked in. And again, just think back to your normal. Um, squaddy or whatever he was living his life in in the hobbit hole that was the countryside of britain literally brought into a living hell where he's he is literally part of a machine now you know that's what yes uh, that's what that's what the artilleryman has been reduced down to he's just like a living machine 
use to, uh, to to fire and to destroy. And and I think it, it is undeniable, like that um, when you look at a piece like this, you, you see um, uh, there's kind of aggression. There is uh, power, vigor, vitality. You know, like, like that. these these are the kind of words that are often associated with early modernism. And, and I think um, war is the the, the natural, um, I guess, subject for, uh, for for modernism and, and those ideas. And you can see here that, like, obviously, it, it's, it's an interesting piece. You've almost got kind of three levels of um, figures here. On uh, on the left here, we've got almost these almost re realistic here figures. Uh, again, it, it, they're not really cubist. We're not seeing them from multiple sides. It, it's more kind of more kind of futurist, but they've certainly been kind of abstracted. Where you've got this kind of big, uh, you know, a fist the size of a man's head, for example, and there's there's this kind of realism and normality, and they're looking onto the actual action that's going on ahead, and almost instinctively we're transported into a different realm where the humans have been uh, turned into these like long oblong or oblong shapes and what do they what do they match up with well the shells in the background you can almost see that this guy's shoulder is a shell or this shoulder is a shell or this mm -hmm. foot is a shell you know, that they are the man is machine. yeah exactly mm -hmm. and, and then at, at the end here you've almost got this um <laughs> these kind of melted figures this this like t total uh, catastrophe as we kind of uh, uh, you know see the story story uh, con continue, so mm -hmm. it, I, I think it's a really interesting piece. Again, just colours wise, you've got the kind of green, green and yellow, uh, and and black as the kind of three, uh, maybe, yeah, three kind of major components to it. But they're all these kind of murky colours. You've got the kind of mustard yellow, evocative of mustard gas, of like. Um, like a flare in the night sky look at the kind of highlighting on here it's almost like they're in the dark being lit up or you've mm -hmm. got the kind of green the greens which are murky and disgusting and filthy yeah which again is, is just, um and, and then yeah and then e e even the kind of smoke plumes have been just just smoke plumes. yeah exactly these, these these harsh um harsh objects so you know this, this is definitely like if modernism is going to work it's going to be in this kind of setting so yeah very mm -hmm. powerful uh, image Yes, and um, uh, if you just um, switch to one of the images of him in his uniform, preferably the one with the um, cigarettes, there, yeah, that one. Um, some, some, something, I mean, you, you mentioned um, uh, was the First World War the most like artistically expressed war in Western uh, history, maybe. I mean, I'd say it was certainly one of the most um, cinematic wars uh, in, in history. I mean, like this picture just sums that up for me like it was such a like i don't know like like i mean the, it, i think it's a testament to the character of Wyndham lewis that a lot of people will sign up to the army to get a, a sort of good looking uniform and then take like sort of cool poses in that uniform but most of them are not particularly cut out to fight whereas Wyndham lewis could act like a complete dandy in uniform and then go out and do one of the most dangerous you know, nerve nerve wracking jobs in the war, and then and then just come back like nothing happened. I mean, I mean, he didn't write about the war for a long time afterwards. But and one of the incredible things I get from reading certain biographical accounts is that, despite seeing all the horror firsthand and being out there in in no man's land under all that stress, he he almost seemed to have had he he almost seemed to have had fun with the war, like he. He seemed to have really enjoyed it in a weird way. Um, you know, he he kind of took to it, um, and it it didn't seem to affect him negatively. Um, so you know, I think that's quite a testament to his character in some ways. Um, maybe maybe a worrying one, but a testament nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting because you have you have um, soldiers who have very different experiences, and I mean, and, and it certainly is true that there are soldiers who have good wars and they are very well adapted and. Yes. Um, they they cope with what they see a lot better than others. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean it's it's, it's absolutely true that there are some um, people who are very well adapted to to these events, and they're not necessarily um, military types. They're not sort of career soldiers or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we move on to one of his other paintings at all? Uh, uh, yes, or... I think there's another First World War painting in here somewhere. Um, but yeah, there's him with the. Uh, oh yeah, oh yes, I, sh I should have done this one earlier. This is, uh, 
I believe this is by um, by Wyndham Lewis. This is a representation of the Vorticists meeting in a Parisian cafe, I believe. Um, so you got uh, Wyndham Lewis there in the middle, Ezra Pound on the left with the big hairdo, um, and various other figures uh, I could name, but I don't know much about them. Um, and I, I believe, ironically, this in itself is quite an important uh, painting of the time. Um, I've seen it certainly in a lot of uh, discussions about art of this period and in various art books and things. Um, it, al it always seems to be reproduced. Um, so I don't know if you've got any sort of deep lore on this painting, uh, uh, Alexander. Um, I, I suspect it might be someone called Roberts, but I'm not sure. But yeah, he, he was part of the Vorticist group. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so this is, I mean, as I as, um, came up in the stream when I was discussing this with uh, AA, that we talked about uh, the men of 1914. So you had mm -hmm. like a whole group of people who were seen as vanguardists, but they were also seen as reactionary. So they're artistic modernists, but they're political reactionaries. Yes. And this included, and this included, um, uh, Wyndham Lewis, it included um, uh, Yates, uh, also um, Joyce, um, um, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, um, so the, the, and these were seen as sort of like a, uh, and they all and they all knew each other and they were all sort of broadly allied um, in their intentions. Uh, and uh, and this was uh, this was slightly separate from the Bloomsbury group, who were a lot more aligned with sort of socialism. Mm -hmm. Bloomsbury is absolute absolute degen, worst kind of degenerates. Uh, um, okay, <laughs> this channel is now anti, lo lo <laughs> anti Bloomsbury. <laughs> I am very anti Bloomsbury. Like um, I, I, I sort of a soft soft spot for the uh, Omega Workshop, but. Uh, Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll run through the rest of Wyndham Lewis's life uh, a bit more quickly. Um, so, uh, yes, he came back from the war. Um, the Vorticist groups was broken up, um, although there was an exhibition in America in 1917. Um, that was, I think, their last exhibition. Um, then he wrote a novel um, called Tar, which is a kind of avant-garde novel that plays with language and it's about a german and an englishman who live together in this kind of rundown flat in paris um set quite before the war it's it's a kind of philosophical quite nietzschean book um quite good i quite like it um and uh he he wanted to kind of uh, see if he could paint a book so he used these kind of weird effects of punctuation um and what's happened is since then the book has been reprinted many times as a normal novel without all these weird avant-garde lit literary techniques. Um, and recently there's been a movement to republish the 1918 edition, which was as he intended it, which is now available, um, luckily. Um, but for for almost 100 years, it just it just wasn't. Um, you couldn't get it. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so he, uh, he, he became... So he, he resumed his career as a painter after the war, um, he also continued to write. Um, he wrote essays. He wrote a lot of satire in the post-war period. He launched another magazine called The Tyro. But again, there were only two issues of that, um, though it contained an important, a very important essay about plastic art. Um, and uh, he apparently, uh, in the 20s, this is, this is the point at which he fully became um, kind of a perfect draftsman. This is where he spent time really um perfecting you know uh the the technical side of art um although ironically once he'd done that he then concentrated on writing um he he launched other magazines he wrote he just kept writing and writing and writing i think he um, wrote about something like 50 books it was absolutely insane he, he wrote he was the man was constantly putting up books um unfortunately so many of them are just out of print now there, there's no uh, no real way to get them unless you find some rare antique copy. But um, anyway, I'll, I'll get on to why that is in a minute. Uh, so he wrote a uh, philosophy book um, called The Time and Western Man in 1927, um, which was kind of about... He, he actually was criticizing um, the artistic milieu of his day. Even people he was he was friends with, and you can clearly see the influence of uh, Bergson in that book. Who, of course, he, as we said, he saw the lectures of when he was a young man. Um, he critiques uh, Gertrude Stein. He critiques Ezra Pound. He critiques James Joyce. 
he critiques Yeats and a whole bunch of others. Um, and kind of, again, a modernist who critiques modernism. Um, he wasn't afraid to do that. Uh, he, he really felt that um, there was some, some flaws in it, which of course there, there were, I think. Um, and uh, he also have held the opinion that the artistic peak of humanity was ancient Egypt, that we had yet to reach that peak again. Um, though I haven't read the essay in which he claims that, uh, but it's an interesting one, certainly. Um, any thoughts on that? <laughs> any thoughts on the uh, ancient Egyptian art being the peak? Uh, well, I, I have, I have a, a huge deal of respect. Um, I think a lot of people uh, haven't seen, uh, I mean, they've seen the monumental sculpture and they've seen some of the wall paintings and some of the sarcophagi decoration. But if you look at the some of the sculpture, it's absolutely astonishing. It's 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 well worth the stream, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I'm I'm always team Minoan over. Uh... <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh no. Maybe, maybe that's what we'll do. We'll do an Egypt versus Minoan yeah. bron Bronze Age art meltdown. Yeah. Exactly. You and you and Alex fight, and I'll be the referee. Um, and we'll get AA to compare because he likes that yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, could, yeah, art, art blood sports. Yes, be good. Um, so uh, around this time, uh, it, it should be said, Wyndham Lewis um, never held a steady job, and his and his work in writing and art was never steady enough that he could live off it either. And his unique method to deal with this was to simultaneously have, or to kind of use, three or four different studios all around London. And what he would do is he would get into debt um, to pay for various things, to pay for the publication of his next book or whatever. And uh, then when the creditors came knocking on the door, he would jump, he would grab all his kit and he would jump out of the back window of the studio and run to a different one. And he would stay there for a while. And then when the creditors eventually caught on and found out where he was, he would do the same thing. So he just he, he went round and round in this big circle of apartments and artistic, <laughs> artistic studios all around London for most of the 20s and 30s. That's how he lived. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes. I'm writing notes as you speak. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it is pretty sad, isn't it? You know, creditors come knocking on to the studio. <laughs> and I'll be safe there for a few months. Um, yeah, so that's that's how he lived. Um, he was also he was in quite poor health for a lot of his life, um, as and that we'll get onto that more in a bit. Um, his eyesight was quite poor. Um, he needed uh, various uh, organ surgeries and things like that. Um, and uh, in 1930, he published a book called The Apes of God, and I have this. This is a wonderful book. This is a, one of the most funny books I've read. Um, which is basically a massive satirical attack on the artistic literary scene of London of 1930, which includes an enormous, vicious attack on the Sitwell family. Um, you may you may have heard of um, Dame Edith Sitwell um, and her relatives, who were, uh, you know, they were uh, poets and painters and all sorts of things. Um, very very prolific uh, kind of patrician artistic clan. Um, Again, very much knocked by this book. And this book really harmed his his reputation. A lot of people then refused to talk to him or work with him. Um, and anyway, this is where he begins to get political. Um, because he published a book which, um, in 1937, the year after the Civil War started in Spain, which criticized the communists and attacked the leftist um, faction. And he attacked um, all of the English... Uh, and, and British men that went over to fight for the leftists, um, including an attack on what, a very young uh, George Orwell um, or Eric Blair uh, at the time. Okay. Um, yeah, see, he, he was, and this is where he basically established himself. He establishes himself firmly on the political right. Um, so he puts out more philosophy. He publishes a book of poems. Well, um, he, he had he had previously painted, uh, published a book um quite supportive of uh, a famous Austrian politician and artist. Uh, yes, I will. He's, yeah, I've, he's just I've an got... art lover. Wyndham <laughs> just loves fellow artists, guys. I have think. I have a whole bank of info on that. Um, OK, go ahead. Yes, we'll get on to that. So anyway, um, Civil War, um, he become at this point, he's, he's known as a kind of national artist. He's he's writing in major newspapers. He's conversing with the kind of the, the, the big wigs of the day, including, you know, poets and, 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 and writers. Um, uh, 
he wrote more about the Spanish Civil War, which seemed to kind of fascinate him. Um, uh, the Tate Gallery, uh, there was something with the Tate Gallery. He, um, he was going to put on an exhibition, um, something to do with the Civil War, and it was it was closed for some reason. I think perhaps for political reasons, and a huge collection of artists and uh, um, uh, a huge collection of artists and writers uh, supported him and made a petition to the Times, and uh, the his paintings and things were then put on again. Um, and uh, he was kind of influenced in that by surrealism of the 30s and uh, the kind of metaphysical painting of uh, the Kiriko. Um, and he was, again, he, he kind of, if, if you read his art criticism, he seems to have really hated uh, surrealism, but he, he worked in it nevertheless. He was constantly cr um, critiquing the surrealists. Um, no, not, then, not, least, not least because they were politically tied to the communists. Yes, and he really didn't like that. Um, anyway, so... We're now leading up to um, a minor incident in the middle of the last century, which is called the Second World War. Um, and I don't know if many of you will have heard of this, uh, but uh, there was a chap, uh, an Austrian chap, who um, wanted to become an artist, but he couldn't get into art school, so he went into politics instead. Um, and while he was climbing to power and becoming leader of Germany, Wyndham Lewis published a book called Hitler in 1931. And I have to say, even for the even for the year it came out, it is a little bit ridiculous because obviously, you know, Hitler, whatever we think of him, was uh, very open about the fact that he wanted to launch wars of aggression and take over various places in Europe. And he was open in his ideology in his book, uh, his famous book, that uh, certain countries needed to be conquered by Germany and certain things that needed to happen. And Lewis published this book called Hitler, which which was making the argument that Hitler was a man of peace. Um, and, uh, and he kind of really started to, um, to support Hitler in his writings. And this basically tanked his popularity completely. Um, and then once Hitler actually came to power in 33, um, Lewis actually went over there. He, he, he visited, um, he visited uh, Germany twice in that period. Um, basically to try and, you know, drum up support among the artistic class for Nazism. And um, he went there again in 1937, um, and he, he started to change his views a little bit. He started to kind of uh, see that there was something of a danger to what Hitler might do, and he kind of toned it down a bit. Um, and he was, let's say, um, well, he, he, he started to be concerned for what might happen to the Jews in Germany. And he wrote a book in 1939 called The Jews, Are They Human? Um, which is not what it sounds like. It, it's a, <laughs> it, it was a it was a basically a, a book uh, in which he basically said, look, I think I've got everything wrong about this Hitler chap. Um, and I think uh, I think maybe he he's he's a bit of a crackpot. And I think he's going to kill a lot of people, basically, is what he said. Um, and th this is, again, this is uh, a bit of a shame because the reason that most people haven't heard of Wyndham Lewis when he should be regarded as one of the most prolific authors and uh, writers of the last hundred years was that Wyndham Lewis, because it was this period where he basically was pro-Hitler and then he retracted it a few years after. Um, and because of this, he is, he is, you know, tarnished as, you know, a fascist and you can't mention his name in universities and, you know, he's... Um, He's, you know, uh, you can't write about him or, or, or rehabilitate his, his, his reputation, you know, evil, evil fascist, you know. Um, and this, this, this was only like, this was about, this was a seven year period. And most of that was actually quite skeptical of Hitler anyway. Um, so he kind of went into isolation then. Um, but if there's anything he didn't like more than Hitler, it was the fact that Britain made an alliance with the Soviet Union. Um, and this absolutely outraged him. And he couldn't take this at all. And he kind of completely almost gave up on being a public um, figure at this point. He was very, very put put out by this. And, and he kind of, um, um, he, he, he kind of started to become completely disillusioned with Britain in the modern day. Um, and so after the war, 
um, he continued to kind of uh, work and paint a bit. He became very interested in Mexican art. Um, he wrote about uh, Diego Rivera and uh, Orozco um, and talked about the kind of uh, primordial mix of the Indian culture of Mexico and the kind of Spanish uh, layer over the top. And he kind of, he praised it for being kind of authentic in a way that he felt that Western art was kind of posed um, and not authentic. Um, and then in 1951, um, he was completely blinded. Um, he had a tumor in his head that placed pressure on the optic nerve, I believe. Um, that yes, basically, right. you know, his, so he, 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 his eyes appeared normal, but he couldn't see through them. Um, but the incredible thing is he was one of these people who just refused to give up on art. He continued to write particularly. And his method was that he had two rulers, um, uh, rubber, rubber banded across a piece of paper over a board. And they were a set uh, distance apart from each other with two little blocks. And what he would do is he would write within those two lines, then he would move it down and write the next line. And just as, as a blind man, you know, just sat, sat there largely alone and completely out of money um, in, a, in a time which had basically forgotten him now, now that you're into the 50s. Um, you know, he's, he's, you know, this, this, this isn't 1914 anymore. Um, and he continued to write. He, he, can, he wrote about, he wrote about five books while blind by hand. You know, this is this is this is quite a significant achievement. Um, and he and this is where he reaches his kind of peak reactionary stage um, because he 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 calls he calls life in London um, living in the capital of a dying empire. And um, he wrote a book called Rotting Hill, which is uh, if you can find a copy, is very good. It's just about you know you know. As AA would say, the ashes, you know, the, the ashes of, of, of civilization uh, in London. Yeah, th this was based on the fact that he he lived in a very, very squalid um, flat in uh, Notting Hill. Yes. Uh, and, and, Not and Notting Hill at this time was not very shishi. It was extremely um, down at heel. Yeah, this was not a pleasant place. And of course, the capital was still completely wrecked by uh, uh, Blitz uh, damage from all the bombs. Um, and then he died in 1951, the year after, pretty much. Um, and a few books were published after his death. And uh, that was it. That was Wyndham Lewis. Um, and his legacy is enormously complicated. And I think he's badly misaligned. And, uh, you know, I think it's a shame that he basically, you know, as a man that completely gave himself to art and art kind of spat him out, <laughs> I think might be the way to say it. Or at least the art world did. Yeah, yeah. I think I think well, there's been a lot more sort of posthumous uh, appreciation for his early work, especially. There has. Um, and vorticism has, has has been sort of back in vogue for the last sort of thirty or forty years. It's it's there's been been a lot of um, study of uh, the of because uh, it was only a, a really a, quite a short movement and. So it's a quite a limited body of work, but uh, there's been a lot of interest in it recently. Okay, um, brilliant. Obviously covered quite a lot um, there. So we're, we're, we're going to go across to uh, Alexander, who's going to talk through another uh, modernist during the First World War, but a little bit more abridged. Wind Wyndham got the kind of star treatment. Um, so let's uh, dive into your um, pick, Alex. Do you want to just take us through? Uh, yeah, so this is... Um... Let's uh, get the screen right. So this is uh, Paul Nash. We're, we're just going to sort of cycle through um, his his Wikipedia images because they're, they're actually it's a decent selection. Um, so he was um, uh, he sort of came to maturity in the in the um, Edwardian period, and he was kind of establishing himself as a as an illustrator, as a sort of pastoral illustrator. Um, uh, along with that group who became sort of uh, well known for reviving uh, woodcut um, printmaking in the sort of the 1910s, 1920s. Um, uh, yes, he's described here as a surrealist, but we're not really going to cover that at all because we're just going to focus on his, uh, his early stuff. Um, surrealist movement didn't start until 1924. 
uh, obviously uh, a little while after the First World War finished. So this is a self-portrait, and this is uh, yeah. So this is he was uh, an official war artist from 1917 onwards. Uh, the position of war artist was established in 1917. So it's interesting that you this didn't actually occur until you know almost near the end, close to the end of the war. Um, so I think this was a, like a, a concerted effort, as I said, to buy. Um, leading leading figures in the arts and, and politicians and so forth to record not only record um the war uh but also to protect their artists um their favored artists um from actually being because there, there was obviously there was the draft um so if you were fit you would be and you were of serving age you would be called up uh, and there was a danger that you would actually die and so obviously a lot of um we, we, we know, of course, a lot of the famous um, poets of the First World War died in the war. Um, and I think that there was this um, feeling amongst artists. I mean, you couldn't really have a war poet who was sort of like, you know, um, kept back from the front line. You couldn't have sort of like a roving poet, um, although they do, do exist now. But you did have sort of roving artists because they could produce something material which could be sent back and could be exhibited and could be stored in museums and so forth. Um, and it required material, it required space and time. So that's why the artists got special treatment as opposed to the poets. Uh, so. I, I will be petitioning Panama Hats to be the World War Three's first roving art war poet. I, 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 <laughs> on, I, would, I would love poetry. that. I would love. I would love to just like travel around a war zone and just and just write poetry about it. I, I'd love if anyone's going to sponsor that. You know, email me. <laughs> yeah. we'll get, we'll poets without it. portfolio. I think. Yes, well. poet That's without portfolio. <laughs> official official war poets or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so here, here we have um, uh, one of the paintings from uh, 1917. Uh, he saw active duty. Um, so Nash, Paul Nash saw active duty. Uh, also, his brother John is an interesting artist as well, but we're not going to mention him. Uh, he did. He, his brother John did one war painting from the First World War, but uh, is better known for his later landscapes. So it kind of falls outside of the remit of this. So this is um, Wire. So this is uh, barbed wire in the trenches, uh, well, around in no man's land. Uh, so this is made in 1919. He was he was a war artist for from 1917 to 1918, um, and his works were quite well received when when, when they were displayed uh, in London. Uh, but obviously he was he was producing a little work afterwards. Um, this ended up at the Imperial War Museum. This would have been gone. This would have gone to the War Office, uh, and and I think that the Imperial War Museum was founded on the basis of uh, the collection of the War Office uh, and the various armed forces. Um, I'm I'm amazed that they were actually allowed to do this. And again, some of the pictures we'll see later. There is more honesty in these photos than anything I think we've seen with today's war. You know, again something that obviously close to my heart but the levels of propaganda we receive in war nowadays is almost total and positive you know the side the side that we support is winning constantly our enemy side is about to, to be destroyed we never do anything wrong but mm. something like something like this is it's brutal you know it's mm. unbelievably harsh like again if you did this today the equivalent to today of doing this would be an actually independent journalist showing the true brutality of your side of war or like just how bad things really are and, and you know just look at it the color the colors um there is like a harshness to it the tree totally destroyed and flaccid next to it and there's not there's not a single dead person in there you don't need to show uh death you, you just know that this is a, just a devastated harsh and cruel landscape mm. Yeah, and, and often you get war artists doing things that you wouldn't get propagandists doing. So you're often getting them being quite sympathetic towards, well, being quite critical of their own side, um, being quite sympathetic towards the soldiers, um, not necessarily the war aims or the leaders of the enemies, but the soldiers of the enemy. Um, so it's a sense that, you know, we are we are all, although we might be facing each other, we are actually comrades because neither of us, neither side wants to be here. Um and uh, and so that you you do get this sort of 
a, a sort of a broader human view uh, of the situation. Mm. Uh, yes, this is a, a particularly good scene. So this is um, um, a flare on a parachute um, fired up to uh, allow um, soldiers to gain views and also to mark out positions. Um, this is uh, from 1918. So this is in Ypres, which is, uh, as Hat mentioned, uh, this was the area that um, Lewis was in as well. How, how would you describe Nash's style? Like, where, where did he sit? It's like a post-impressionist? Yeah, well, Zab, he's. I mean, he, he's. So. Uh, you you could say he's he's quite close to he's quite close to vorticism because he's got lots of lots of straight lines, lots of flat angles, lots of um, facades. So he's sort of he's a he's a he's a sort of post cubist romantic artist. So you see sort of lots of elements of of modernism, but he's got a romantic feeling. Um, so he's certainly interested in mood. He's not particularly interested in action. I mean, I don't think there are any sort of actual war um, pictures, um, you know, sort of, uh, sort of, you know, sort of um, action scenes, as it were. Um, but you do get this concentration on um, the landscape as uh, a setting for human drama and human action. And this is also highly um, atmospheric and moody. It's, it's interesting you mentioned about the, the kind of romanticism here. You, obviously, the the flare in the sky in my mind is instantly reminiscent of an angel or something divine, with yeah. the rays of lights kind of pouring down. And again, in the context of that time, um, you know, you you'd have seen something like um, the uh, the Annunciation, mm -hmm. um, or the kind of the the um, you know, clearly the, religious. The yeah, ex exactly. Mm. And, and so you have this kind of like religious undertones to this painting. And like you said, there is no action. Or, there you is... know, like the, the shepherds following the star of Bethlehem. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All you can see is three, you know, figures huddled down. And it was if it was only for their helmets, I think it'd be hard place to tell this was, was a war. So, you know, a very mm. interesting, um, almost kind of like a juxtaposition of... Um, like symbology and forms in the new this kind of new um this new landscape mm. and and also nash started out as like as a pastoral artist so he spent a lot of time in the english countryside uh southern england very cultivated so lots of you know sort of hedgerows and rolling fields and so forth uh and that was um his uh that was um how he spent a lot of his time he studied at the slade uh, which has already come up and the Slade were quite well known for producing landscape artists they're based in London so at the weekend so a lot of artists would uh, a lot of art students would go out into the home counties which is the area around London uh, and they would do work from nature um, artists like Stanley Spencer actually lived in Cookham in Berkshire another one of the home counties and he would travel in every day by train uh, so he didn't actually live in London um, so Nash is part of this scene of uh, the this Slade School of Artists who spent a lot of time in the English countryside and were considered themselves sort of pastoral artists. So this is a, a preliminary study, study for um, a famous painting. So this is um, from 1917. So this is um, one of the areas that was uh, heavily shelled during um, the last stages of the war. Uh, this is so uh, yeah, and so this is the uh, final painting we are making a brave new world from uh, nineteen eighteen. Um, brave I mean, new I mean, world, of course, comes up. Yeah, in, I mean, I mean that's, that's 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 like a totally brutal title again. I'm just amazed they got away with this. <laughs> Literally, again, I I think I'm just so scarred with today's like online safety bills and uh, political correctness. Yeah. But like, I, I imagine the level of discourse that you had in the first world war is actually pretty good you know you can actually say, say say things i mean again this is just like such a harsh uh title I, I guess there is a sort of optimism to it there is the kind of like the the sun rising there is greenery inside there but then again it's just total brutality and again it's interesting seeing his um the kind of drooping tree as one of his motifs um again where it's got this kind of flaccid almost um dali-esque um 
uh, like yes. melting clock fe feel to it, which gives it this this kind of depressing feel. But yeah, like... this this art was was quite well received when it was exhibited. I and mean, there were a lot of people who were very critical of Britain's involvement in the war. So you know there was a lot of division over the ethics and the actual outcome of the war itself. So you did have quite a diversity of opinion. Mm. So this is one of the rare, very rare scenes uh, of actual action. Um, so this is uh, another late painting from 1918. Uh, this one's a bit more dynamic. And so the, this, uh, so the Men in Red, this is the, the last great painting that he was commissioned to do. So this was when he was finishing off his work as a war artist. Um, and this is a particularly sort of panoramic view uh, and it, it combines the sort of, you know, the, the modernism, you've got the those sort of very um, sharply defined rays of light coming through the clouds, the clouds being quite artificial and uh, uh, faceted. So that's quite close to sort of cubism and futurism. Um, but then you've got like the muted tones, which is, of course, realism. And you've got the figures as well. So you've got like a sort of um, a, a largely figurative element to it. I love these kind of concrete tactical sugar cubes in the corner there. Anti-tank <laughs> anti sugar cubes there. Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, okay, if, if that's the last Nash one, um, Panama, what, what's your view on some of the paintings? Any, any um, feedback or thoughts on his work? I, again, I think it, um, it goes back to um, this, this idea that um, somebody who went to the First World War what they saw there, like, yes, you, you, you can paint a kind of traditional war painting of it. And uh, that isn't, that isn't inaccurate or, or incapable, but I think the experience was so total of being, of being in that war and seeing what you would have seen that kind of, you do need to kind of bring in elements of the surreal and, you know, like these kind of, uh, these kind of almost metaphysical, references to heaven and angels you know these beams of light and the star in the previous painting as you said um you know there is something about this war that just needs that kind of i don't want to say zaniness because that was that would be a real downplaying of what this art is but that kind of uh that kind of extra step in the direction of something experiential rather than a straight depiction of what of what you would have seen you know I think the only only person to have described the First World War is as only there. Uh, but it kind of was, you know, in an like... objective way. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yes, I mean, just, there, just... There, there were lo there were lots of people saying that you you have to completely remake art because the experiences uh, uh, and the way that um, the results of the war were so beyond anything that had ever gone before that, that you simply couldn't use the old means, the old methods, the old stylistic approaches that you had to do something new. And this was a large impetus of um, the rise of modernism, actually the domination of modernism after 1914. Just, just one thing to say about this kind of uh, understanding that realism can't show you everything Roger Fry was particularly interested in Byzantine works of art, both in terms of their lack of perspective, but also the ideas of, um, you know, transcendent and metaphysical um, uh, interpretations put in, in in artistic form. So again, I think that, that you know that those ideas definitely held true in those circles at the same time and and would have been read. So def definitely interesting. Okay, okay, we've got half an hour left. What I want to do is to give a bit of a, uh, a, a counter to these filthy degenerate modernists that uh, <laughs> Hatton, <laughs> Alex are representing and, tr and try and make a case for the, the academic painters. Now, um, w w one of the paintings we saw a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of times ago was from uh, singer sergeants, the general officers of, of World War One. Yes. And, and uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, jump on this for, for, for too long but sergeant was my first pick now it, obviously sergeant by this by the, the time of the first world war was about 63 you know he was uh, a bit long in the tooth he had his kind of hey, heyday in the kind of high victorian period doing these kind of uh, i would say like beautiful academic paintings 
lots of uh, society uh, portraits. I think, in my mind, uh, Sargent is one of my favourite painters of women, actually. I think he really captures the essence yes. and the beauty, the beauty of women. He captures um, femininity. Uh, yes. And he's, very, and he's very good with clothing as well, mm -hmm. and fabrics. Definitely. Um, but I like the idea that this, uh, you know, <laughs> geriatric artist passed his heyday, saw World War One, and said, I want to be an official war artist, and got, got himself involved in the front. Now, um, obviously, we've got these kind of like large, more kind of bombastic artistic paint, um, academic paintings, but he also produced a series of smaller um, on the fly watercolors. That he captured along his travels and um, i think there's a real uh, again this isn't necessarily strictly uh, <coughs> uh I, I guess you still count as, as academic there's certainly more impressionistic about it you got to bear in mind that he is uh doesn't have his full uh full full kit if you, if you uh ever see an oil, oil painter you need a lot of materials you need a lot of equipment a lot of time this is why people have studios so when you're out and about you, something like like a small little palette of watercolors um, means you can produce something and you can move out of the way of artillery fire at the same time. Uh, and he produced these kind of uh, quite b beautiful series of uh, watercolours capturing little moments during his time. So this is uh, a landscape in Ein uh, Rudera, these kind of like uh, crosses from... Very, uh, from very a... eerie. Yes, ex ex exactly. And, and again, think about w watercolour as a, as a medium is that it's sort of like anti anti-graphic you can't have these strong bold lines everything sort of blurs into each other you can't really build up layers in the same kind of way it's much it's, it's much harder so um you have to be more uh, kind of powerful in, in your in your brush strokes and, but um, what it gives you, you is uh, just just sorry. quickly did, did you say that um sergeant actually went into the trenches and on, onto the front line to do these I, I don't think he was in the trenches. I, th I think right. he was just um, out and about. You'll, you'll see a, it's a couple more shops. Um, and again, he or well, he certainly chose to, to cover non-trench related work. So I, I think he was keen to stay out of the actual action, but was interested in what's going on, basically. Um, and, and this is the, this is a kind of a beautiful, beautiful moment. And it's it's this very ethereal again um, the kind of the fallen cross across there this kind of forebodingness and also um, you know obviously a foreshadowing of things to come with the, with this with the seas of crosses uh, during the first first world war um, here is I guess this is Columbus uh, grandfather across here in, in <laughs> killed yeah. Um, just again capturing a little moment here and again I, I love I, this is a, gr a great uh, composition because everything is kind of framed by this gigantic building across here which gives you the perspectives gives you this kind of movement in the work but you've got this kind of chaos on the left hand side and then um, uh, just a, a moment of respite as well and again the, the kind of the the Scottish figure across here literally Stanley Contraposto as well gives a gives this kind of classical element uh just in terms of colors he's he's working with a really tight palette of uh gr greens reds um and almost like blue bluey blacks so mm. again you can see like the kilt in the uh, in the trees in in the darkness in the carriage so so again he's having to um because of the the the, the, the lack of time he's having to just to capture the moment so quickly uh, a person is literally a, a couple of squiggles uh and you, you miss out on that kind of perfection of academic uh detail but there's some i think he does an amazing job of capturing some quite complicated uh, poses there um here's some uh cheap being transported across uh, again this is not watercolors i think this isn't this is an oils um yeah. but again it's done it's done super super fast so, uh so quickly that you know people's faces aren't even being depicted they're all kind of blur to each other but that sort of makes sense it that feels right in a in a sea of uh soldiers they are the faceless um and again you've got the kind of the the new troops versus the uh the injured who have almost become even more uh, faded and uh mol um blended out if that makes sense hmm. so again the kind of freshness versus uh, departure and the uh, the kind of invisible officer class across there at the top there maybe a little bit of a a, co a comment uh this is one of my favorites which is a 
a crashed airplane. And again, you've got these uh, Belgian <laughs> Belgian peasants having to live. You know, they're trying to, you know, mm-hmm. this guy with a, a, a scythe, his, his wife sheathing the, uh, the corn. And in the background, you've got this, you know, the war has arrived yeah. and, and it's devastating. And this is, it's again, it's the, the juxtaposition between technology and, uh, and war and the harvest in the past, you know, the scythe versus the uh, the war machine. Um, but you've got this, this serene moment with a, uh, a crash landing and, and a, uh, you know, and a, and a warning at the same time. Interestingly, he tried to do a couple of, uh, again, what I would say, kind of these almost kind of quasi symbolic um, works. I believe this is meant to be like um, a soldier with uh, victory and death. So he's hold, he's holding um, Nike or Nike in in his uh, right hand, and then death uh, in in the left. He looks like they're in a bin bag. <laughs> but it's it's interesting because if you see that kind of high Victorian period, they love this kind of stuff, especially around like the Crimean War. Um, yeah, you know, classical uh, allegory, and I think it's like you said, it just it, it really doesn't work in this kind of setting because um, it, the moments of, moments of heroism are massively diminishing. If that makes sense, it's mm-hmm. like it's it's you, you've got things like those kind of cavalry charges and those kind of moments, etc. But apart from that, you know, what's what's heroic really about? blasting someone to pieces with the world's largest artillery cannon you know yeah it's, mm. it's, it's, it's not it's not the same and so i, th- I think find the answer to that question on my channel uh philosophy of war uploaded yesterday <laughs> <laughs> oh yes i Just haven't actually seen film. that yes to my shit to my shame but that's a good 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 segue yeah. um and then and then we kind of come across to you uh t- to this which is I-, I would say um sergeant's masterwork one of the most during... famous paintings of the war as well. Yeah, ex- exactly. And a cu- couple of interesting things already. So obviously this is called uh, Gassed. It's about uh, you know uh, a whole lot of troops that have been exposed to the uh, the various poison gases. Uh, and you can see here that you've got a, a row of troops, all who have been blinded in the eye. Uh, and um, they're kind of being led by someone who can see, and that's the only way they could get around. Now, just in terms of format, again, this is it, this is an academic style format. If if you see the uh, if you see kind of like an Alma Tadema or um, uh, Lord Leighton and stuff like that, towards the end of the nineteenth century, they love this kind of like quite long long format to give you, uh, and especially with some of the other historical style paintings. So you've got that format, and you've got the realism. You know, this, these people are displayed very, very well. There's lots of detail. And and then look at the number of figures. Like, you, you've got to think that each figure has been displayed almost perfectly, and there's a huge number. This is, this is, this is a monumental effort. Mm-hmm. But then that's where, the, that's where the true academic ends. And then just look at the background. We can see this kind of hazy setting sun, this like filthy yellow um, clouds in the background again, reminiscent of um, the mustard gas clouds, and that's been reflected in the clothes as well. You know, the, the khaki or the, the kind of uh, the green green camouflage has been turned into this kind of sickly yellow. So, even from like a color landscape, he, he's uh, bringing us back to this idea of being surrounded by this horrific gas cloud. But but it's it's a moment of re- real um, sadness about um, pathos and just brutality as well. And I, and again, I think it's a very uh, poignant and uh, yes. brutal painting. I don't know if you can um, your thoughts on it. Well, I mean, it's the it's the masses of wounded and I I, I can hopefully these men appear to be wounded and not dying. Um, you know, they're they're recuperating because. Uh, if you were caught in a gas attack, as long as you didn't get um, respiratory or skin burns, what would happen is, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact um, chemical reason for this, but it causes you to go temporarily blind. Um, you I lose... think it's, it's, it's because of uh, the reaction. It produces chlorine when it comes into contact with wet areas. So that's why you get burns around the eyes and the mouth yeah. and the nose. Yes. Um, though I, I, it was, I think it was quite, it, it generally wasn't permanent as far as I'm aware. Um, it would it would go away in in a while, or if you if your eyes were cleaned, I think. Um, so it was it, this was quite a common thing in the war. These these kind of columns of men who were who were blind for the time being. Um, 
waiting to to regain their sight, if at all. Um, and yeah, I mean, it it speaks to kind of you know, like there were. I, I, I get the sense that you wouldn't have depictions of a kind of behind the lines scene like this in in wars prior to this so much. Um, this is you know this quite quite large scaleful painting just depicting this. You know mm-hmm. this is this is what it looks like at the back of the front line. You know all these just wounded men with you know who are, who are blinded by gas. You know. I think it's yeah. I think it's worth mentioning that there there is one precedent. Um, I think there is only one precedent before this. This and it was a painter called Lady Butler, who's actually a female artist, and she went and studied um, the uh, during the Crimean War, and she went out there and she did paintings of um, various cavalry units because I think she was a. a horse specialist as it were and she actually became a military painter and one of her most famous paintings was called uh, the roll call and it's notable because it uh, actually shows um a unit um after uh, a battle and it depicts a uh, shell shock and this was the first painting that had ever depicted the actual uh, psychological impact of war so lady butler's painting the the roll call is worth looking at because uh, that's i think you're right this is this painting is one of the few paintings that does this uh the lady butler painter is the only is the only one before this one i think yes mm. um and in fact i believe yeah she also painted uh, the first world war didn't she that's right yeah she had a very long yeah. career and she went she went she lived long enough to be able to do some paintings of the first I, war. Well. I, I believe she actually went to the middle east um in the first world war and saw um she she saw some of the great uh, cavalry actions out there and and uh, painted them. And if if I'm not, I may be confusing her with 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 somebody else. But I believe she actually founded the it's still around today the charity that deals with service animals. Um, yes, I think the, yes, I think so. Yes, because yeah. the British army basically dumped a huge amount of draft and cavalry horses in the Middle East um, when they left and didn't just 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 abandon them there. And so there were these masses of basically mistreated animals uh, around and she founded this organization which uh, um, found homes for them or had them shipped back to England. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting woman. And her descendant was pivotal in bringing back those Afghanistan dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. Oh dear. No Topical, topical. Topical. Um, okay, okay. Um, that, that, that was Sergeant. I just wanted to, to um, you know, bring up this idea of uh, c- could symbolism have work in this kind of setting? And this is a uh, this is a picture by uh, Charles Charles Butler, and uh, he is kind of like your your more kind of standard um, like late pre-Raphaelite, like almost like Waterhouse level uh, romantic um, painter. And this is a uh, piece of uh, it's a work called I think it's literally called like Blood and Iron or uh, Blood and the Land, and you've got um, the Kaiser in the centre here, looking down from his horse as the Angel of Death kind of points out to the future, while uh, you know Jesus helps the helps the the wounded across the uh, across here, and you've got the kind of defiant Belge shouting out shouting out again. So these the are civilians who are. Yes, yeah. that's right. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so it, it, this is a really interesting piece for me because this is like what, like, Im- imagine if this was the majority of of the of the work. And in my opinion, it, it's not it's not good art. It, it's um, it, especially again, I, I am a lover of uh, lover of Jesus, but this is ter- this is a terrible. <laughs> this is like a terrible, almost kind of you know the kind of kitsch nineties Americana. Jesus take the wheel style um, bits of artwork that you occasionally have. Here we here we have um, uh, you know Jesus feeding the uh, f- feeding the the, the, the wounded um, while the kind of Kaiser looks on in madness. I mean, there's a few interesting bits like I like the uh, the kind of cannon projecting out of his horse. The horse itself almost looking maddened. This this idea of you know the the the, the horseman of the apocalypse um as well 
but I, I think the problem with some of the academic stuff, it does look a bit kind of pastiche and a bit sentimental. Um, and, this and maybe is very something... close. This is very close to the 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 posters, propaganda posters that you've already analysed on a different stream. Yeah, we, we're not going to talk about those t in too much detail. Check out yeah. uh, World War One propaganda stream with with AA. That's on his channel. Um, but it, it is it is it is similar. But I, I think just a, just a hat's point about this is not the this is not the war to do this kind of art. And I think this is mm. this is one of the reasons why it just doesn't. Um, feel right in the same kind of sense do, do, you, do you think it's something that you can't pull off in an age when people have access to photographs of the of the actual war i i don't necessarily think so i i, I think part of it is I, I, again that maybe if it was a little bit more abstract and again i I'm imagine i imagine like someone like gf watts approaching this mm. and again i think the kaiser as like a, a figure of e evil and hatred, I think it's uh, an interesting concept. And if you kind of abstractified it, mm. and almost he's this kind of like floating dark. F imagine you know, like w w Watts just has like a central figure sort of dissipating in 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 the background. That's what that's what I would have done. And I think it's more powerful. They tried to make it too real. You know, it's it, this is kind of like here's here's the Kaiser, and again. It, this guy kind of shouting out. This this is like low level Soviet propaganda levels of uh, art at the same time. But um, mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't want to dwell on it too much. But just an interesting, in my opinion, um, you know, a failure of of the academy. Yeah, and it's uh, it's just it's worth as an addendum to that piece. Um, the thing to remember as well is that to most Britons, regardless of where you stood on the political spectrum, Britain was an admirable. Um, country in their estimation that uh basically even even the kind of most radical leftists would basically say you know what we have here in, in in britain is something to protect you know this kind of um again i hate to use the word liberal but kind of uh, decentralized kind of um you know traditional english society that, that still existed essentially outside of you know outside of the major urban areas um and especially you know people like chesterton um that t to them it may seem odd to us now but germany was genuinely a kind of barbaric country um with this weird kind of prussian system in which everything was done by by force of the military and everything was dictated by railway timetables and you know everybody learned uh, how to be a soldier at school um and, and the kaiser was seen as the kind of the kind of war chief of this barbaric clan as such um and the whole the, the whole reason that britain was so enthusiastically uh, in favor of World War One, was that they considered this to be the case that if if they don't fight, then the Germans are going to come here and they're going to turn Britain into Germany. Um, what was? So, do you think that's the original boomer truth regime, though? Was I that think really the way it was. Well, I I would say no. That's that's I I. It's obviously far more complicated than that. But mm. that was the general sense of the time. Um, I mean. The thing about World War One is we're always we're always told that you know oh you know the, the reason why and it was terrible and you know they like all these men died for nothing. That is not how it was seen at the time. You know that the it was perhaps uh, some historians have said the most popular war Britain ever fought while it was being fought. Um, you know the, there really was a sense of like you could have asked anybody in Britain what you know why is the war happening and they'd be able to tell you. Um, I, I I do know that there was quite a bit of controversy over the the war atrocities. Now I know that people have there have been really strong arguments about over sort of debunking these as propaganda, but then other people saying, well, no, actually we do have evidence that some of this happened. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's it's and I think the shocking thing is that really this wasn't more closely investigated in the twenties and thirties to see exactly how accurate these war atrocity stories were. Because um, it would have been fascinating to actually have get got sort of hard data on this uh, yeah. after the fact. Um, but I, as far as I know, these are really still contested, very contested. Subjects. Yeah, it, it is. It's highly contested. I mean, the the kind of, you're right. The First World War basically is its own boom of truth, you know, um, that certainly laid the seeds for the second one in this country, at least. Um, but I mean, basically, my point was to link this with this painting and the kind of the representation of Kaiser, the Kaiser is the agent mm. of death, you know. Uh, death is kind of whispering advice in his ear, whereas, you know, Christ is tending to the innocent and the wounded, you know, beneath him. Interesting. Yeah, maybe maybe it would have had like, a, it's like a popular 
Yeah, it's almost like a propaganda uh, painting. Okay, we're we're desperately running out of time. I want to see if I can oh, get um, two 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 of my favourite uh, war, war artists. The first one is Austin Osmond Spare. His little picture. If, if you think we're going too fast, and we do have, we could have enough material for a, a part two. Okay. So okay. so don't don't maybe, feel maybe like I'll you just have cover to. One. Yeah, I'll, I'll just cover spare, and then we'll um, I'll, I'll save save some of the other stuff for for, for an, another time. Now, just a little bit a bit about uh, Austin. Um, he basically had a working class background. Um, ended up in um, Lambeth, which which again uh, very very popular with a lot of the new sculpture guys like uh, Alfred Gilbert uh, and and the, and the lot. Um, was a uh, very talented painter for uh, a draw, uh, um, draftsman from a, from a young age. Interestingly, um, again, similar to Wyndham, he produced a whole load of um, periodicals and journals, etc. But I, I would say his style is more um, kind of like post Beardsley or kind of like post um, Jung and Still, that, that kind of like G Germanic art nouveau. And um, just going to summarize some of his kind of early work uh i've, I've got this kind of uh this, this painting he was very much interested in uh East Terrier. he got him, he got himself involved with uh, crowley um if semiagog's listening i think this is the kind of uh, interesting figure that uh, he may be uh, in, interested in but but he was kind of producing these kind of works high, highly like very very graphic uh yeah this is done in 1912 um very mystical you've got this kind of like woman next to a lion but she's also maybe like a nymph and there's birds in her uh in her antlers which are turning into to flowers i mean this guy's on a lot of uh laudanum let's just say uh it's pretty pretty trippy stuff but quite, quite interesting at the same time but he was uh picked up during the war to uh, and produced uh some really uh some really fascinating works uh, I've kind of grouped them together thematically just to give you a bit of a feel of his works. He he did he, he uh, he's done several really interesting portraits, and again his style again retains the kind of graphic nature. What, what we've seen so far in a, in some of the some of the other works, like even with Sargent, he paints very loosely, impressionistic, impressionistically. You've got this kind of um, harshness, kind of almost like pre-Raphaelite richness. I would I would say or m maybe even. Uh, um, how can you say? I know a bit of Van Dyke or whatever, or Car Caravaggio. You know this kind of Charoscuro mm. style, um, and and also he painted loads of interesting people who weren't necessarily that famous. So you've got S Sergeant doing all of the kind of cheese of staff. You've got um, um, this uh, this kind of random matron matron in chief who I've never never heard of before, but I think this kind of quite charming and interesting and uh, poignant uh, little portrait. And he produced many of these. I've got to tell you, a lot of women uh, going through the archives. Uh, you know, I got to okay, I get, well, you know. I, get, I, get, I get the feeling is a bit of a, a, a ladies' man. He was this is uh, yeah Dame Rachel Crowdy, the principal commander of the the Vads, which I think is just like the. Uh, Obviously, a lot of women were involved um, with, like, in the in the galleys, cooking food and uh, organizing stuff. I mean, it wasn't as bad as cursed se cursed Second World War, uh, you know, uh, wrens and you know women taking over yeah. everything. They had very the specific backbone of the boomer truth. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I mean again, I, I, it's interesting. I need to look into more into it, but I, I think they played a very specific role, which uh, like played to their strengths. Let's say, and I'll I'll say no more. Uh, and I, I think this is like uh, done with pastels as well, um, as opposed to uh, to painting. But again, this you know very very beautiful, poignant, but again very graphic at the same time. You know, it's, it's very rich in terms of colours. Lots of uh, uh, illustrations of the darkness, uh, darkness and light. Um, but he also produced these amazing uh, trench, uh, trench bits of trench imagery uh, as as well, um, which are some of the most kind of brutal and uh, beautiful bits of art that um, I've seen. I'll just take us through uh, a, a couple of them. Um, here's just a little, uh, here's a scene from the trench where you've got uh, a couple of kind of figures sleeping here on the left, ha uh, left hand side. Um, there's your the kind of officer <laughs> doing some kind of uh, ex bullet extraction from this kind of cackling face in the corner. 
people there. Trepanation, um, maybe. And, yeah. 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 Um, it almost reminds me of like uh, bacon or something like that. You know these kind of horrific, uh, scowling, scowling faces. Um, um, but the again, just look at the colours. It's these kind of uh, pus ridden yellows and uh, dark, dirty browns, and and it's and it's filth. And it's about being stuck in this kind of hell on earth. All you can see is the trench. There is literally like a passageway to darkness across here that the officer is half halfway in. So again, there's these kind of interesting um, esoteric undertones and also lots of uh, these kind of grotesque moments. The guy's face here is obviously it's it's, it's kind of showing the brutality of uh, life on the trench surgery, but it's also almost like this kind of cackling death-like figure in the uh, the, the, uh, the corner. Um, here's a man in a German man trap. <laughs> again, <laughs> like who, it, it, it's, it's a, a, a grotesque. Uh, Hello? Like me? Yeah, you. Uh, I don't know if that was just me, but you went really. Uh, uh, you sounded. You sounded very far away from the mic all of a sudden. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, it's it's really interesting because I don't think there's anyone else. No one else has kind of depicted a man trap from the First World War. You've got this figure right at the center. The the rest of the kind of landscape is a, a similar color to some of his other work, but it sort of fades into the background. So, you always you almost end up with this kind of quasi classical pose as yes. this man is trying to uh, help help his uh, what's left of his foot from this horrific uh, <laughs> beast beast of a trap as well. Um, yeah, and um, I think something that's important to mention is we've talked about you know how technological World War One was and how it was kind of this you know airplanes and artillery and gas and all these sorts of things and all these kind of these kind of new machines, but most of the actual man-to-man -man combat in World War One was done with makeshift uh, trench tools. So, like, literally most of the actual infantry-to-infantry -infantry fight, if, when it occurred, was bayonet, daggers, knives, clubs made of woody, wood and nails, and, you know, spades and pickaxes. And, like, that That was, in, in a sense, it was both very technological and extremely brutal and close up, you know. Like, that. that was the... That was where the sort of a lot of the killing was done, um, if it was done by hand. So yeah, that combination of low tech and uh, high yeah, tech. Exactly. Yeah, it's called a man trap. Uh, this is this is one of my personal favourites. This is uh, a, a a soldier who, who attempted to save himself from gas. You can see his kind of gas mask, but was was not able to uh, make it in time. You've got the uh, the medical medical doctor across here try, trying to tend the wounds. I can't remember if he's dead or not. Uh, meant to be dead or not. I think but again, maybe not. He's having his wounds tended. Yeah, so, um, maybe. But you've got this kind of horrific, almost non-human-like figure. He's almost like a a zombie or something like that with with the with the mask. And again, it's showing the kind of de dehumanization of that. This this the kind of hand almost rising up from the grave on the left hand side. And again, the kind of sig signature colors being used. The the um, the severed uh, tree across there blasted away, and these like interesting. Like flickers of uh, uh, of black, almost as if they're like cinders or um, you know shards of the tree that's yeah. been blow, blown apart. But again, the, the kind of medic is this uh, person of still and uh, peace in this brutal, disgusting uh, landscape. Um, so that that's um, Osman Spare. I think a really, really interesting, underrated figure. I'm going to be doing more research into him actually because he's he had quite a career afterwards. But um, there's much about him at all. So uh... I, I think I think we've got enough m material for more on the Allied or the Entente side because uh, we've because we've not touched on other British artists. There's also Nevinson, who's a great British artist, and also the Americans, although they were only briefly in the war, they were barely in the war. Uh, there's a couple of interesting aspects that are worth talking about there. No, for sure. Okay, so definitely we'll do uh, uh, a part two at the same time. But I, I, I don't know if you guys want to kind of round up what we've seen so far. Hat, if you want to kind of um, summarise it, summarise your thoughts. I mean, it, it's it's a difficult one to kind of to kind of bring bring together to a point because it's such an open ended thing. Um, I suppose that. I think as as we as we sort of covered, there's that whole aspect that a war kind of almost opened up a new experiential way of painting, and 
you know, the various figures that saw it and that fought in it kind of, um, uh, it kind of formed them in various, in various kind of different ways. And there's clearly um, a kind of an artistic community, which has been through that war and one that hasn't, you know, the, the kind of vorticists, like I expect, like I look at a figure like Ezra Pound, for example. Before the First World War, he's almost playful in his art. Um, he is kind of almost he's taking it seriously, but he has this kind of frivolity to him and a kind of silliness that he deliberately plays up. And you know, we you know we're gonna. He 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 kind of looks at this sort of charming late Edwardian. Uh, uh, sort of Western world, and he kind of like you know pats it on the head and and is charmed by it. But at the same time, he's going to he's going to you know radicalize the bourgeoisie, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the First World War happens, and all of a sudden, everything becomes deadly serious. You know, after the war, it's all you know um, the economic theory. Well, what are we going to do about Jews? Um, you know, uh, we need to radically take over the society and do this and that. And poetry has to be completely remade and. Like, you know, all, all this sort of thing. So I think that's just a, an example of just what the First World War was to art as, as a whole um, and what it kind of did to the people that, that saw it. And, you know, um, I suppose really that modernism came out of it with a new life and traditionalism came out of it worse for wear, I think. Um, though not dead. <clears throat> okay. And uh, Alex, any last thoughts? Um, no, I just I thought uh, Panama summed it up very well. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, tune in in a couple of weeks' time, and we'll have uh, part two. But um, in the meantime, have you guys got anything to shill? Maybe uh, Alex, I know that you've got a couple of uh, big, big, big announcements. <laughs> well, well, funny you should mention that, Faro. Uh, yeah, I do have a couple of things. If you could, I think if you could bring them up, I just had a couple of links. Um, that I will go through very briefly there at the end of the image list that I sent. Uh, the end of the image link. Yeah, I so these you, I have, the... I've accidentally closed down your tab. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 put, I put it. I put it in. I put it in the description of this oh, video. Okay, there. okay, okay. Right. So that's fine. So if you, if people just want to click, I've got two books available at the moment. Um, we've got one book which is a book on book of my poems on the life and art of Francis Bacon. That's Francis Bacon, the painter, modernist painter, not the, um, the restoration um, essayist. Or, yeah, restoration, I think it was, yeah. Um, so that's available if you go to uh, my website, which is alexanderadams.art. You can go to the contact page and contact me there. Uh, it's also available via Amazon for people who live in Britain. Uh, there is also uh, the new pamphlet, the new political pamphlet, which is very small, but it's called uh, Towards a Based Barbican Outline for a Dissident Arts Centre. Um, uh, just a short pamphlet on um, approaches to how we might organise um, some sort of uh, centre of uh, countercultural resistance. And you can also get that through the same method. I will be selling both of these copies, copies of both of these, at the event in Birmingham on Saturday at the end of this month. Brilliant, um, Panama. Obviously, you've got a new rival in the poetry in the poetry scene now with uh, Alexander <laughs> also selling poetry. No, certainly not. Um, healthy competition, if anything. Um, I'm. I will, I'm very... I, I, I will also be writing a series of poems. Meta, meta, meta no, you won't. no, you won't. Based on most of your poems, that's my poetry. Is um, but uh, yes, um, I'm glad to. I'm glad just that uh, there is some sort of artistic uh, flourishing. It seems in this community. Um, I'm. I'm. I just. I'm very glad that more people seem to be engaging with art and, and looking to make it. Um, yes, I'll be uh, at the Nomos event uh, this coming weekend. Um, and uh, yes. Uh, I'm going to bring out a book called 41 Sonnets um, later this year. I say later this year, probably in a few months' time. Um, more on that when it comes. Uh, just watch this space. Uh, there'll be um, an article on my Substack soon about the First World War um, and the kind of pri uh, primordial boomer truth, as it were, um, and some thoughts on that too. Um, 
uh, new video up on my channel this week as well. Um, find the link to my uh, uh, Kofi page, and you can buy me a Kofi or a tea uh, there on that link. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's all I've got. Okay, wonderful. Um, just a reminder, please leave a comment. G give us your thoughts on uh, Wyndham's work in the battle for modernism versus the academic in the First World War. Who do you think had the lasting, uh, most lasting impact? Uh, and please, I want you to artillery fire that subscribe button. <laughs> Bom bombard that subscribe button. I would need to raid the trench of the like <laughs> the like button. Oh dear! I want, want you to bayonet the like the like. Oh, yeah. Better. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Charge! Um, char charge that bell. You know. Exactly. <laughs> and with that, good night. All right. Good, good night, night, everybody.